Um, okay, everyone, I think I'll get started because I understand you have another excursion um, at 5.30 to meet in the lobby to go on a city tour. So I'll try to end a little early, uh, give you a little more time to get ready. Okay. Um, so in this session, we're talking about data quality. Keep in mind, if you want to learn a bit more about climate, um, that's happening in the Regency Room. Um, so uh, you can attend there as well. All right, so for data quality, we have released just recently a new toolkit on data quality. Um, I'm going to try and talk about some of these things. I might not be able to mention everything in an hour, um, admittedly, but I'll try to talk about some of these things and I'll try to demonstrate some of them for you as well so you can see them. Uh, I think one thing that's important to note, uh, many of you who've used DHIS2 before for data quality, uh, might be familiar with the WHO data quality tool. Um, there are some changes there that I will mention um, just so we're transparent from the beginning. Um, uh, but uh, I will also go over the toolkit itself, everything it contains, um, and, and you know all the different aspects there. So, so there's a number of different concepts that uh, I'd like to cover. Uh, and we'll see how far we get. We might not cover all the features. Um, for example, there's a lot there. Um, and, and we are looking at other ways to share this information. Uh, and build more capacity um, to manage uh, quality of data within different systems. All right, so just some general comments on our approach and how we have designed this data quality toolkit. So um, we, we've heard this word toolkit a couple times now. The toolkit for data quality is built a little differently, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but generally speaking, for our data quality toolkit, we base it on a comprehensive guidance that's provided by WHO. So they have a set of uh, data quality assurance guidelines. And uh, this presentation is on Google Drive, and I've linked to these guidelines in the presentation. There's four manuals in that uh, WHO uh, data quality assurance guideline toolkit, um, including a new one for community health that they just released earlier this year in March, I believe. Um, so it's quite a comprehensive guideline. It, copy, it encompasses desk review. It encompasses routine data quality review. It encompasses a number of measures and indicators that are used um, and concepts and principles uh, used for measuring um, public health data quality. So it's a very good tool and it's generic and it's not DHIS2 specific by any means. There's no real mention of DHIS2 in those guidelines, um, but it's just a good toolkit to use when looking at uh, health data and, and measuring data quality of health data. So uh, previously, we have made this WHO data quality tool and used it within DHIS2. And, and some of you may be familiar with this tool, right? The, the WHO data quality tool or WHO data quality app, okay? Um, but there are several challenges that we've had with this tool, and we've seen this happen in many places. Um, for example, we could not output any of the outputs from that tool onto a dashboard. Um, there were some performance problems on large systems as well. So if your system was very big and you were trying to analyze large amounts of data, the app could crash or just not work as intended. Um, and we've seen this in several systems um, at the moment. Um, also, because you couldn't save uh, various outputs in the WHO data quality tool, a person had to know how to navigate the tool in order to kind of replicate and what people were seeing for certain aspects of data quality. Or if you wanted to perform routine review of data quality, similarly, a person has to add filters and navigate to the right spot in order to perform that routine analysis. Um, so we kind of try what we're thinking around how to automate this a little bit more essentially, right? So how to make this so people could log in and see the errors or see the issues just upon kind of logging in with people kind of maybe setting things up for them and then those outputs being saved. So, you know, they could just mark them and follow up on those specific values that were marked for follow-up essentially, okay? So at the time that the WHO data quality tool was released, a lot of the functionality that we're discussing, it wasn't really available within DHIS2, but, but that has changed quite a bit. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna discuss today in terms of, you know, how we can transition some of these things over so we can create a lot more automated analysis for the purposes of measuring data quality. Okay, now we're slowly phasing out this WHO data quality tool, okay? Um, and what we mean by that is it won't be updated anymore um, because uh, of the challenges that I mentioned before. Um, and we have some complementary tools that we've developed in order to um, make sure that this transition is a bit smooth. Okay, and we also have a new application being developed in particular for this, uh, it had a feature for a uh, generating an annual report. Um, this did not run well on large systems at all. So the new app uh, is being built from the ground up 
in order to, especially with a lot of kind of performance behind the hood, um, to make sure it doesn't, you know, just crash or fail on, on the systems that are relatively large in size, which a lot of systems are these days, um, admittedly. So there was kind of mixed success with the implementation of that tool, I think, over the last couple of years. But we still base everything on those guidelines. So just a quick comparison in terms of where we are right now, in terms of what the WHO data quality tool, all the functionality we built inside that tool, and where we are within the DHIS2 core. So we can see that for the most part, we're, we're almost there. We've almost got everything inside of DHIS2 at the moment, where you no longer need to use the WHO data quality uh, app to do the various uh, data quality analysis. This half uh, check mark here for the completeness and timeliness of data elements, it's supported in the annual report, but not in the WHO dashboard. So that's why I said half. Um, but, but the point here is that uh, one, we have some variance, some differences between the WHO data quality tool and what DHIS2 can do. We can see not one of these tools at the moment covers both, okay? Which is why we're still supporting that tool for the moment, okay? But the idea is that all these features do get put into the core. Um, so then you can use, you know, you can make dashboards, you can automate all the analyses, you can create various outputs for people and they can just log in and review those and, and mark those issues and not have to necessarily have specific knowledge on creating various data quality outputs. So we are moving or transitioning a lot of the functionality over to DHIS2. And we can see in this comparison here, actually a lot of this is almost done, right? We just have a, a couple other small things to kind of add in. Um, one for this consistency over time using scatter plots, that's not there. And then this, this quality uh, annual data quality report, we are building a new app to create that. That will not be a core part of DHIS2. That will still be via an application. And if we have time, I can I can maybe show it uh, as well. You can kind of see what the future looks like a little bit. Okay, so we've talked about toolkits. Uh, Yuri talked about these in a previous session. And if you attended that session, he would have given you a bit of a breakdown on what the uh, a toolkit typically um, is. Now for data quality, it's a little bit different. It's not a metadata package. It's not a, um, a set of, of, of guidance necessarily just focusing on a particular disease, okay? Um, but the data quality toolkit comprises many different components. We have new documentation and I'll show that. We have a demo instance that's set up with all the features that I just described here. So you can see how they're configured, how they can be utilized, you know, and think about how you can apply this to your own systems, okay? And that's also true for all the other toolkits, by the way. Um, where there is a demo instance available. Okay, we also have some new tools that we're developing. Okay, there's a new app for data quality review for generating that annual report that I spoke about. We'll see if we can show it or not, depending on time. There's also a uh, script for generating minimum and maximum values. Um, I'm not gonna necessarily get into all the details, but I'll just cover what min, min max is. We also have for data quality specifically, a number of SOPs and checklists. Okay, so this is to help more on the implementation side. Um, we have a draft template for an SOP that you could take and, and implement in your own setting. We also have a checklist for uh, the sub-national level, so a district or lower, for example. What type of behaviors should they do on a routine basis? So all of our toolkits focus on our, what should be done on a routine basis rather than analyzing data quality once a year, okay? We're really looking at once a month or once a week, right? Depending on the frequency of your data. And we really wanna implement procedures to check on data more routinely and not just as a big exercise at the end of the year, okay? Um, and then uh, sometime early next year, I'm still working on the schedule, um, but we will have that available soon but we will have a new data quality academy with a lot of new training uh, guidance on implementing these features, configuring these features. I'll cover some of them now, but this is really a crash course. The academy will, will of course be a lot longer, give you more time to actually log into DHIS2, do exercises and configure everything that we're going to show today. Okay, so this is kind of our path forward and there's a number of links here um, on the screen and this is in the presentation as well. So you are able to access this. Okay, so uh, first I'm just gonna quickly start with the documentation that we've created. So we've created documentation separated into four sections. So we have just general principles for data quality. This is largely based on this uh, WHO data quality toolkit um, that I mentioned earlier, or sorry, this uh, data, uh, the data quality assurance guidelines. I should call them the correct name. Okay, we also have then, then we split it up. 
into a couple of different sections here. And uh, we can, I'll just increase it a bit more so you guys can see that there. Yeah. So we have the, the principles themselves. We have data entry, okay, which is focusing on data quality features you can implement for people that are entering data. Okay. We have then uh, a, a section on analysis which is all the different analyses that you can perform on the data after it's been entered. And this is the largest section. There's a lot of different analyses that can be performed. And then we have a section on imp implementation guidance. Okay, So this is around the SOPs. This is some extra stuff that might need to be configured to support some of the procedures. Um, this is the checklist um, and implementation guidance around actually getting this uh, kind of making it work more from a systems perspective. right? So not so much focused on the DHIS2 configuration, but thinking about routines and procedures that you need to implement in order to get this to work in practice. Okay, so um, these were just released. I think we just finished them last last month. So they're very new, very fresh. Um, and and uh, if you want to learn a bit more about this, I do suggest you have a look at these these uh, in more detail, as it'll give you a lot more information than I'm able to provide in the next hour. Okay, similarly, I mentioned a demo instance. So in the presentation, there is a link to this instance. I'm going to use this to demonstrate some of these features as we go through the session today. But uh, here's the dashboard that uh, the data quality, we have two dashboards actually that we've configured, one for kind of the national level, one for lower levels of the health system, for example, facility or district, um, which focuses on, there's different measures um, that we kind of uh, focus on. Um, when we when we discuss this. So we have some things that you you may be familiar with, um, just reporting rates, for example, of data sets. We also have some new measures that I'm going to discuss in this session. So we have measures for data element completeness, which is actually looking at the completeness of individual variables, not entire data sets. We also have um, facilities that are consistently reporting. I'll explain some of these measures um, that we have here um, on data quality. There are a number of new measures we've introduced as part of this toolkit. And, and of course, we've talked to some of our partners like WHO and Global Fund um, in order to uh, derive these measures. Okay. Now, you can see the good thing about this, of course, is that I have a dashboard. I'm not logged into a separate application. So if people log into my system, I have a number of data quality issues they can review, and this can be reused across many levels of your health system. Um, so, you know, this would allow people to log in without any particular knowledge, specific knowledge on setting up data quality measures or features and just review the data quality that's there, you know, on a routine basis, rather than having to go to a different application and add in filters and configure it the way they want it to, to get the output that they need. So this is kind of our whole rationale behind revising our procedures, because this allows people to log in and review this on a routine basis, you know, to hopefully, however often the data is collected. Um, here we have some other measures here. Data element completeness, again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, facilities consistently reporting, I'll, I'll discuss how these are derived. Um, we have some different charts here. You might recognize these um, from, from your own work or previously, where we have scatter plots, we're viewing consistency of related data. In this example, where we have two variables that are related and we're examining the difference between them and if they fall within an expected pattern, essentially. And I'll explain this more um, as we get into that, okay? We have dropout rates. Uh, many of you might be familiar um, with uh, dropout rate calculations. They're very common in immunization, for example, but can be used for other purposes. Okay. We just have some uh, various consistency over time charts, right, where we have various values over a set number of years um, in order to evaluate their consistency over a, a various periods of time. And this is all just measuring kind of internal consistency. Um, then we have some new measures here. Uh, values excluding outliers, okay? And I'll, I'll discuss what that means as well. So we do have uh, three or four new data quality measures that we've implemented with the help of our partners um, in order to kind of look at data in a different way than we're used to. But we also have a lot of the classic measures in place that we're used to seeing as well. Okay, so uh, I have the demo link in the presentation. Just go back. Okay, it's maybe not in the best place, but it's it's the last slide here. Okay, so you can log into this demo. You can log in while I'm doing this presentation if you'd like, and you can have a look at that dashboard. Okay, so we have two dashboards, but if you just type in uh, data quality, okay, you'll see here we have one data quality core. 
That's the national level dashboard, let's say. And then we have one for the facility. There's some different measures here. So for example, in this one, um, we're also examining um, the reported value versus what we derive as a threshold, a statistically kind of uh, sounded threshold. So for example, the mean plus three standard deviations or some other threshold, a calculated threshold for the data. So the facility has some additional measures that aren't on the national dashboard because they aren't suitable um, for measuring at a national level, essentially. Okay, so feel free to log into the demo and review this as I'm going through the demonstration. Um, I'll be using these dashboards um, to demonstrate and discuss and explain some of these features a little bit more. Okay, and once again, if you open the presentation, it's just the very last slide, okay? And you can open up the demo from there. And the login details are on the screen. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna focus on uh, are features for data entry, right? So this is basically to, we wanna be as proactive as possible where we can in order to mitigate the amount of data entry errors that we are seeing. Now you might be familiar with some of these features already. Admittedly, they're nothing too complicated or complex, but the whole idea is that we try to reduce the amount of errors that we're seeing um, at the point of data capture, okay? So the first concept that I'll talk about is validation rules. Now, many of you might be familiar with this, okay? Um, so validation rules consist of a left side, uh, right side, and an operator, okay? And this is a measure of internal consistency where we're measuring data within our system. These can also be used to measure external consistency if we bring in data from another system, for example. Maybe you bring in survey data as an example, then you can also create measures of external consistency um, when using these validation rules. Okay, so uh, validation rules measure what should be true. And uh, if it's not the case, then you detect a violation essentially. So you are able to view these directly in data entry where our focus is right now, but you can also have them run automatically okay, in a batch. So let's say you wanna view a number of organization units together and see if there's some challenges with their data quality. You can run these as a batch operation and then view the results. Maybe that's more applicable, for example, at a provincial or national level, as an example, okay? And then you can also run them manually in bulk as well. So you can either view them by individual data set or have them run bulk on a schedule or through a manual procedure. Uh, here's just some examples of what it looks like. So I'm actually just gonna switch over, okay? So this is our regular data entry screen, all right? And uh, many of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. Okay, and I'm just gonna run a validation here. So this is an example of validation rules at the point of data capture. You can see here, there's a number of issues with my data, right? Um, now a person um, who's reviewing this, it, it kind of depends on the training that you've given them, right? Some people might be able to review these values and change them, some people may not, right? That's why we have operations that kind of feed upwards. So you can also look at this in, in bulk and not just one at a time. Right, But if the person is able to review these rules um, and change the values accordingly, maybe it was just a, a mistake when they entered their information, for example, um, then this can result in you know, some significant uh, savings in time um, when you're reviewing your data and your data quality. So as an example here, we have a couple rules that have been uh, violated, right? Um, so cases treated should be less than or equal to the number of suspected malaria cases, as an example. I'm looking at this one here, okay? So we would, we could possibly change the, one of these values, either the left side or the right side, um, in order to correct this. Now, the person would, of course, have to understand that um, in order to do this, um, but that could be done. So, for example, So for example here, I removed some of the values for cases treated because there were no suspected cases reported. Um, so you can see a number of the, the, the number of rules showing now is much less um, because of course we've been able to fix that error, okay? So it can be as part of your routine procedures if you set all these rules up. These are configurable per, well, you know, it's a local customization. You can configure these per instance, um, per um, setting, setting. 
So you want to make sure you have local rules that make sense, that follow internal validation checks. But there are guidelines for setting these up. There's a, um, a toolkit called the WHO Facility Analysis Guidelines. And for a number of health programs, they have guidance on what makes sense for reviewing internal consistency. Okay. And just real quickly, this is the new data entry application. Um, so Austin and Phil talked about this a little bit um, before. And you can also run validation rules in this new data entry app. There's a bit of a different interface, and we can see that here. Okay, And the validation rules appear on the right side of the screen instead of as a pop-up. And we get the kind of priority and a better bit of a nicer description and everything in terms of how to handle the rule. Okay, So these are available both in the previous or current data entry app, if you will, as well as the new data entry app that's up and coming. Um, and they're configured the same way. So uh, I'll show you that I have a number of resources available where you can review how these validation rules are configured um, if you want to add them. But generally, our, our implementation guidance on this is that all of your aggregate data sets should have these rules. And then for things like a tracker, you want to have program rules or program indicators, for example, that check the validity of your data during data entry. Okay, So always we want these warnings or error messages or things like that to pop up to prompt people um, when the data is not being entered accurately or as we intended to. Okay, let me just zoom out before I switch over here. Okay. Okay, so on the implementation side, we have some general recommendations uh, on using validation rules. So firstly, we recommend, as I mentioned, any data set that you have in DHIS2, you should review and check if you have the necessary or required validation rules that you need. Because a lot of times what happens is we the data set is created and, and the validation rules are not created and then the training happens and the data set gets rolled out, a lot of data is entered, maybe you add the validation rules six months down the line, you go to check things and you're not really sure how to fix the data. So it's, it's better to kind of have this in place before you do any training on anything you're introducing. And if it is after the fact, okay, no problem. It's better than nothing. But generally speaking, try to be a bit proactive with this. Um, a lot of the times data entry can occur from paper, right? So you're having a paper form of some kind and then entering the data manually into the system. It's not entered in real time necessarily. So what the user can fix you know, that might be limited in scope. So you need very clear procedures and some training and guidance for those people. And of course, it depends on capacity uh, as well, to some extent, if that person entering uh, data doesn't really understand necessarily how everything relates together, it might be hard for them to go back and fix things, right? But generally, the more you can do on this, the more you can improve, because it allows things to be corrected at the point of data entry. Um, we also recommend that uh, validation rules should be set up only when they're basically impossible to occur in real life, all right? So what I mean by that is, there's two examples I have here. Positive tests should be less than or equal to test performs, performed. Within a month, that's always true, right? I'm seeing the same patients, and the number of tests that I do should not be uh, more than the tests or the number of positive shouldn't be more than the tests that I've done, right? In any given facility, in any given month, for any given time period. That is true, right? The second one, ANC1 greater than ANC4. Now, for a year or for some other longer period of time, generally speaking, yes, ANC1 is greater than ANC4. But for a given period, ANC4 could be higher than ANC1, right? So we don't want something flashing, some flashing error for somebody to say, oh, Go check your ANC1 value. It might not be correct because it's less than ANC4. Well, for a given period, you could have more mothers attending the clinic just because that's when their visit was scheduled for their fourth ANC visit. So in that case, this would not be a good rule because it's only kind of occurring from time to time. Okay, So you want to be careful to, when you set these things up that they follow a logic that makes sense all the time, basically. Okay, And you can perform that analysis over a longer period of time separate, but make sure those prompts don't appear for the user essentially, because that can be con quite confusing. Okay. All right, we also have another functionality called uh, min-max. Um, so this is basically where we can define minimum and maximum values for every variable within our system. Okay. Now, the, the functionality for doing this inside of DHIS2, it's not as well built as it could be. 
but the functionality for comparing the values is very strong. So what we generally suggest, and this is why we have a tool that I spoke about in the beginning, we have a tool for actually generating this min-max outside of DHIS2, but also there's many ways to generate these minimum and maximum values, right? This is a statistical method, essentially, of, of generating these values. So um, we do have a tool, for example, and I've linked it at the beginning of the presentation um, because it supports a number of different statistical calculations. Um, you can see here some of them, for those of you familiar, maybe those of you are not. Um, we use modified Z-scores. We use also this uh, Box-Cox transformation method, um, which is a, a, a method of normalizing our data before calculating our minimum and maximum values for each value um, within the DHIS2. So there are some kind of advanced methods uh, that are associated with this, um, but I'll just kind of explain this a little bit more. Okay, so if I head here, to one of my variables, and this is in the new data entry app. I can also show it in the old one, okay? So you are able to actually edit limits for the minimum and maximum for each value um, within, so let's say, for example, I said one and my max was, or my min was zero and my max was five. So this is saved. Now, of course, you're generally speaking not gonna do this one by one. You can also do this in bulk and generate all the minimum and maximum values together. But as I said, the, the methods within DHIS2 right now could use a little bit of strengthening. So we do have outside tools to help with generating these minimum and maximum values. Okay, so if I enter so a value of seven, um, this value actually is not saved. So we can just kind of try to figure out what's going on here. Okay. okay, and it's highlighted in red. And I just scroll over it, so it might be hard to see this message. I'll just increase it at the top here. Right. And the reason it says the number cannot be less than zero or more than five. And that's because there's a minimum and maximum value set um, for that particular data value. And it's prompting you in data entry um, to make sure that uh, you're within the range that's expected. OK. And generally speaking, we set these in bulk, as I said, not one at a time. Um, but I just showed you real quick uh, how it's done for one. I'll just remove those quick. And we can also do analysis of this in bulk, and I'll, I'll show some of that in a moment. So there's a lot of different stuff here that uh, we're going to explain through this session, and there's a lot of different ways to configure them. So what I've done is I've, add spe I've added specific resources um, for all of these things. So we have links to the documentation. We also have links within that data to quality toolkit uh, documentation that I showed you. This shows you how to configure the validation rules how to use them in data entry, how to apply them to your own system, okay? So within the slides, you can just click on the item and it'll take you to the link, okay? Um, so that would be my suggested method for sure. So even if you kind of, you know, everything's going a little quick, I know, but even if you don't remember necessarily everything in the slides, there's a lot of extra resources on this. We also have um, some more information on minimum and maximum um, if you want to read about that. Okay, so for data entry, we just had a handful of features. For analysis, we have quite a, quite a bit of features, and we've also introduced several new methods um, for kind of measuring data quality within DHIS2 that maybe are a bit different than um, previous ways to calculate uh, data quality that you've seen, at least within DHIS2. Some of these methods have been around for a while, um, but now we can implement them quite successfully um, inside our systems. All right, so first I'll talk about completeness and timeliness. Now, many of you might be familiar with these measures as they're kind of historically represented within DHIS2. So if we're looking at completeness and timeliness, typically we're talking about a data set completeness or a data set timeliness, right? So we expect 12 data sets in a month, let's say. We only get 10 and we calculate our completeness based on 10 divided by 12, okay? That's a very typical way to, to kind of calculate this these things, okay? We've also introduced these two new measures in orange, okay, um, for completeness of data. So this is the proportion of facilities that are consistently reporting, I'll explain this calculation, and the completeness of individual data elements, right? And I'll also explain this one as well. Okay, so data set completeness and timeliness, I think we're all pretty familiar with, and I'll just quickly demonstrate this again. Okay, so this is an example here. We have our data values reported, and then we have the completeness rate reported. 
um, for, uh, on the same chart so we can you know get a good sense if this data is representative or not. These can be very important to let us know, you know, if we're if we're having very low measures of completeness, generally speaking, our data might not be representative of our health system. And then we might have issues with interpreting the data and making some type of uh, action or plan based on that information when it's, you know, let's say we only have 60% of our data, for example, it's hard for us to make conclusions about the service delivery aspects that are actually occurring within our, our setting. Okay, so this is kind of the typical way um, we, we kind of understand uh, timeliness and completeness uh, within DHIS2 at least, where we're just taking the number of expected reports uh, and dividing them by either the, the number uh, of actual reports or the number of kind of reports on time within a system. Okay, we also have a new measure here. So I'll, I'll try to go a little slower through this one, okay? So we refer to this as data element completeness. And this is not new in terms of talking about statistics or data quality necessarily, but in terms of using it or being able to implement it easily inside of DHIS2, it is a bit of a new concept, all right? So um, data element completeness is a useful complement to data set completeness. So it's not necessarily one or the other, we generally recommend that both are in place, okay? And what we're doing with data element completeness, we're not evaluating the completeness of an entire data set, okay? We're actually evaluating the completeness of an individual variable within that data set, okay? So for example, let's say you have a malaria data set. It's got 100 variables inside of it, okay? Um, one of them is RDT test performed, okay? So you can actually measure the completeness of that RDT test performed variable, right? This is more granular in nature. Um, it gives you some more insight as to the data, if you know the data you specifically want, if it is complete or not. The data set could be submitted, but it could be missing many values that you want reported for a given time period. Okay, so that's kind of the difference um, between the two, right? Where you're measuring the variables within that data set. Okay. Now, the way this is calculated can vary. So you can see, basically, I have this little figure here, and I have a number of different denominators for the way this can be calculated. And this is because we can use more than one denominator, essentially, to calculate this variable. So the numerator, generally speaking, it's always the same. It's the number of data values reported for that specific variable. So in my example, I said RDT tests performed. Okay, that's one variable within an entire data set of 100 variables in my example, okay? As our denominator, we can then use a number of different calculations, number of different denominators, sorry. We can use the number of expected reports, okay, from within a data set, okay? So if we're, let's say we're expecting that value to be reported 12 times a year within one facility, okay? That can be our denominator, right? RDT test performed should be reported once a month. That means it should be reported 12 times a year, okay? So that could be our denominator in one case, okay? We could also say, what about the received reports, right? So let's say we only actually received 10 reports, okay? We could take the number of data values that are reported and divide it by the 10 reports that, the, that we've received, okay? And that would give us a different um, calculation, of course, okay? We could also look at data values reported from a related data element, okay? So if we said RDT tests performed, we maybe we can look at microscopy tests or we could look at something else, okay? That's similar in nature that has a relationship with that variable, okay? And we can also look, we can also use historical data instead. So rather than um, looking at uh, current data and reflecting on that, we can look at facilities that have previously reported, for an example, and use those historical data points as our denominator. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna skip this because there's a lot here going on here, but I'm just gonna kind of describe and discuss and, and demonstrate why this measure is useful. So in addition to kind of calculating the data element completeness, we can also run ad hoc analysis um, inside of DHIS2 to quickly give us our data element completeness. So, so one of the difficulties, of course, when configuring this, if you have 10,000 data elements in your system, you have to configure completeness for 10,000 data elements, essentially, using the approach we've defined. That's not really a good idea. What we suggest, just like the data quality assurance guidelines suggest for WHO, is you find core variables um, within your HMIS, and you use those as a proxy for data quality. 
So maybe you have 15 or 20, for example. The Data Quality Assurance Guidelines also discusses this in quite a bit of detail, selecting a core group of variables to focus on quite specifically. Otherwise, the configuration will get a little heavy. But we do have ways to run this without having to configure a lot of stuff either. It's not as maybe uh, specific, but it can give us some um, interesting information. And I'll demonstrate both methods. Okay. Okay. Let me go over here. All right. So let me go to our dashboard. Okay. And here you can see an example output for data element completeness. Okay. And in my example, I've used a denominator. Okay. My, my numerator is the number of values that have been reported. And my denominator is the number of expected reports. Okay. So I'm just doing it for this specific variable. So in this case, it's A and C1. Okay. And you'll see on the dashboard that I made, oops, I don't want to do that. Okay. I just have four variables. Now that's probably not enough. You'd probably want to select a couple more. But the idea is that you have a core group of variables that you create this for, because there is a lot of configuration involved. Um, it is heavy on the system. And if you have too much, it's going to be impossible to kind of follow up on those issues anyway. Right. So you have to make it contained so you can uh, do some proxy analysis and understand what's going on in your system. All right. So in order to create uh, these indicators, uh, we use something called advanced indicator subexpressions. I'm not going to go over that right now. Um, but the idea is that we can create this natively inside of DHIS2, um, and we would select a core group of indicators to do this. So what this is saying is that for this uh, period, for October 2023, within the country, 84% of my, my ANC1 variable is ANC4 uh, is 84% complete. Okay, So for this specific variable, not the data set, right? so this means that we're missing 16% of our data for ANC1 for this particular month. Now we could run it for a year, we could run it for a quarter, we could run it for whatever we wanted to, right? But it gives us a, a more kind of granularity um, for this. And if we compare this, so I'll just remove these bottom ones. Okay. This is the data set it comes from, Rimnica, okay? And, and in, in any given period, the reporting rate is not greater than 67%, but the data element completeness is 84. Okay, so there is some type of variation um, there between our the variables being reported and our data set completeness. So in this case, actually, our data element completeness is higher than our reporting rate. It could be the reverse also, right? So sometimes these values might not always match, and this gives us some more insight into what's going on. And of course, in this case, we'd want to check what's happening because this doesn't really necessarily make so much sense. Okay. It might be because we're using demo data, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's worth investigating these relationships between the two completeness measures. Okay, yeah, and there's one more thing. Okay, and then as I said, you can also do ad hoc analysis of data element completeness. So it's one thing to configure the completeness for all these different variables. That can be quite time consuming. And as I said, you might pick a core set, but you can also do a count of the values that have been reported quite easily using a pivot table or a chart or, or, or anything else within DHIS2. So right now, I'll just change it back actually. So our traditional method of looking at variables is, is to sum them, right? So if I'm looking at the number of doses given in a, in a particular year, it's just going to take the total value. It's going to add them, right? So 13,655, that's the actual number of doses that I've given for this particular org unit for this particular period, all right? Now here I have the number of expected reports. So right now this doesn't help me so much, right? But what I can do, we can change the aggregation type in, uh, in our data visualizer. And what we can do is change it to count. If we do this, rather than summing the data values, it'll count the number of values that have been reported. Okay, so if I click on update now, okay, so here we have our number of expected reports. That hasn't changed, 1,385. Here we have the number of values that have been reported. 
okay, which is 1,179. So we can see that if we use that expected reports variable as our denominator, we are missing quite a few reports. We could calculate our percentage from this, of course, as well, quite easily. And we're able to do this for many, many variables at once, right? So these are all counts, and we can compare them to our expected reports in order to give us some sense of what our completeness is within the system. Now, of course, we, we might also want to create some measures like this one here, okay, which gives us these percentages. That takes a little bit more work. Not impossible, but can be done. Um, but then if we also just want to do some, some more kind of routine analysis just quickly, giving us some information or insight on these variables, we can just quickly use this count function um, within the pivot table in order to give us this. Now, of course, we'd have to make sure to add our reporting rate, right? This is the number of expected reports from that particular data set. And then we have quite a bit, you know, a host of different variables. You know, I have a long list here. Right, And to configure this for that, it would take a long time and, and probably not a best practice that we would recommend. Um, but this is many, many variables for the immunization program. You might only want to select two or three as a proxy uh, to configure in, in totality. All right. So this is a good way to kind of run ad hoc analyses um, of your uh, data element completeness without having to configure too much. All right. So this is also supported and can be quite nice to help support this feature. Okay, this is another new measure, um, and this is for organization units that are consistently reporting. So what we mean by this is that for a 12-month period, or whichever period we define, six months, 12 months, two years, okay, they have reported every month or every week for that period, okay? They haven't missed a single um, period in which they the variable or reports have been blank, okay? Um, and we do this on a per-variable basis once again. Um, there is a fair amount of configuration involved um, in this as well. Uh, we really recommend that you stick to a core group of indicators, to, uh, decide on what those indicators will be, and then configure those in the system. So the example calculation I have on screen is for facilities consistently reporting A and C1 in the last 12 months. Okay. So what we do, we get a numerator here, our facilities that have reported A and C1 for every month in the last 12 months, okay? So if they did not report A and C in any one month, they are not counted, okay? And then on the bottom, we have facilities that reported A and C1 in any of the last 12 months. So as long as they reported at least one time, okay? Because that number will be higher than the uh, numerator in this case, okay? Um, this bottom part is on the configuration. Um, I, I'm gonna direct you to the documentation or to come ask me separately. Um, just for the sake of time, all right? So let's look at an example of this, all right? So we have, in this case, we have five facilities, okay? And we're measuring consistent reporting. Now, the only two facilities in this case that have reported for every month are facility B and facility E. We can see there's no blanks, right? Facility B has reported for every month. Facility E has reported for every month, okay? And then we take the number of facilities that have reported at least one time in that same period. Now, in this case, facility D didn't report any A and C1 values, so it's not included in our denominator. The remainder are included because we see at least some values scattered about. Okay, so facility A, B, C, and E would all be included in our denominator. But facility D is excluded because it did not um, report for that 12-month period. Okay. So our consistent reporting for this 12-month period is 50% because we had two facilities that reported every month, and we had four facilities total that reported any value within that same period, okay? So this is also a good proxy to kind of help us understand, um, you know, how consistently uh, various facilities or organization units are reporting. And if there's a lot of kind of inconsistency, then we would definitely want to check up on those facilities to determine what's happening. Okay, so once again, we do this on a per variable basis. Um, and uh, I just have a measure right here. This is um, basically showing that calculation in practice. So we've taken the number of facilities that have reported consistently divided by the number of facilities that have reported at least one time. And that is the value we see here, okay? And the implications of this, so I'll just 
if I can find it within my sea of different things I've made. Okay, so the implications of this are what I'm, oh no, wait, I don't wanna show this right now. Hold on, give me one second. Okay, so we'll go back to the dashboard. All right, um, so then we can follow up, of course, we can drill down and see those individual facilities that are not reporting um, as well, because we will have the numerator and we will have the denominator available to us as separate calculations, okay? So just to go back, right? The numerator was those facilities consistently reporting. The denominator was those facilities that were not consistently reporting. So we could get a list of all the facilities that were not consistently reporting as an example, because we have that denominator calculation. We can make a list. We could find out which months they weren't reporting and we could ask them what's going on, you know? So as a follow-up action. So what we're trying to do with a lot of these proxies is not just to display values for the sake of doing so, but to give us values that we can act upon, right? Because this gives us lists of facilities that didn't meet this criteria. We can then contact those facilities and ask them, you know, what happened? Why, why are you not reporting? Maybe it's expected behavior and you guys know that and that's fine, okay? But if it's not expected behavior, then of course you'd want to develop some SOPs. So you make sure to follow up with those specific facilities um, when the time kind of calls for it. Okay, before I go on, I've probably thrown out a lot of information. Is there any type of clarification or questions before I proceed um, with some of the other um, types of analyses that can be performed? So far, so good? No. Okay, Farida, please. Can we get her a mic, maybe? I think it's a little bit different with the, the WHO quality app, for ex, uh, ex, especially for the consistency. Uh, based on uh, WHO standards, there is a uh, there is a consistency consistency between indicators, uh, and over time, you said over time cannot provide by the HIS two right, and then uh, consistency between indicators there are two consistency internal and consistency external. I haven't seen the consistency of internal in the presentation. And uh, there is, oh yeah, there is. But in, in you said that only uh, separate between uh, polydecent rule and use min max, while in uh, WOSO standard, uh, we should uh, combine validation rule and the uh, uh, min max or the criteria. So for example, uh, sometimes we, ex we expect that A less or higher than B. And we there is also criteria, for example, 50% uh, or 33%. So I haven't seen that in this DHIS2. Yeah, I haven't got that far. We just, those were just data entry. And then I talked about some new measures. So for example, when we talk about scatter plots, we use various statistical methods here to set the threshold, and it's more sensitive than just setting 33% or 10%. So I'll talk about it here, where we use methods such as median uh, Z-scores um, or interquartile range, uh, which are much more kind of sensitive to picking up these errors, okay? So when we're measuring, for example, consistency between two related variables, internal consistency, we can use these measures instead, um, which are much more sensitive than what we had previously in the WHO data quality tool. So I just haven't gotten there yet, yeah. That's a good pickup, yeah. Yes, Anton. Okay, about the run validations, min max, if the data, if the data uh, imputer input the data and the, 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 the data uh, exceeds the targets and uh, appear notifications, okay. Uh, can uh, the HIS2 platform facilitate it? Uh, the, the, the data imputer can, uh, cannot save the data to that system. Or uh, the data still be safe? Uh, or how? Because, because I think in the implementations, there is some such like a bizarre situations. For example, if there is innovations to approach the services or 
there are a uh, outbreak happen so the data exceeds uh, above the targets so how about that okay yeah so there's an option when you create your data sets um, and it's a uh, complete allowed only if validation passes so what this does basically you cannot complete the data set unless all of your validation rules pass so you can set it will still save the data values however it will not just discard them the values will be saved, but the data set will not be completed. And it will only be completed if all the validation rules pass. So that's kind of our way of getting around this. We don't want to kind of stop data values from being saved. That could be very dangerous on our part, I think. Um, but we can stop the data set from being completed. That way you can follow up on that data set later on because you'll be able to see that it's not complete, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is one method we have um, in order to kind of um, make sure that that's uh, in place uh, a little bit more. About data element completeness, uh, is it uh, only applicable for the aggregate data set? So uh, is it therefore tracker? Yeah. So I mean, the problem with tracker data, uh, we don't know the, the denominator, right? So that's kind of the challenge we have. What is our expected value? How many values are we supposed to report in a month? If you can define that, then yeah, I think you could create some type of proxy, right? But the issue is, let's say we're doing something on maternity and uh, people are coming in for the ANC1 and you're saying, okay, collect Gravita as part of your ANC program. How many times are you supposed to report Gravita in a month? It could vary. We have no idea, right? So because we don't have the denominator, that's the challenge we have right now with tracker data in terms of defining data element completeness. We just don't know the expected value, basically. Um, for that. Now, you could use historical values potentially, right, to calculate the expected value. You could say, okay, on average, 100 times Gravita is reported for, for this number in this facility, okay? And then using that historical data, you could create a denominator and then subsequently create those calculations on completeness. Uh, you couldn't use any expected value unless you had some type of algorithm for that. So if you're able to bring in values to compare as your denominator, um, like I have here, you know, you could use any of these if you have the calculation available. You could still do the same type of procedure for tracker data elements or event data elements as well um, to do that, as long as you know kind of what your denominator is in that scenario. And then it'll work the same way. Yeah. Yeah, Naeem. So um, when you calculate the mean max, so usually in DHS2, we took the uh, last 12 month data and with the standard deviation, either probably uh, standard deviation two or three. But in some cases, uh, in some of the data uh, are much more fluctuating and in some of the data are not fluctuating uh, over the period. So is it possible to define, uh, I mean, is there any plan to uh, make it defined by the data element? So some data element standard deviation is three and some data element is standard deviation is less than that. And also in some cases we want uh, like in uh, some scenario, we need to make the min max with uh, more time span, like for not only for last 12 months, but also for last 24 months or might be last six months. Yeah. Um, right now, I mean, the, the, the features in, in DHIS2, they're, they're not great, right? And, and that's kind of the challenge we're having here. So where did I put that? Yeah, okay. Oh, GitHub doesn't want to let me in. Okay, we have a link here to this Python script. This allows you to modify the inputs quite a bit. So you don't just have to look at 12 months. There's very statistical methods that you can use. Um, you can change a lot of the different inputs. Um, it might not be exactly what you're looking for. I'm not sure, but it definitely is more flexible than what's in there right now. Right now, what you'll often see in DHIS2 is when you calculate the min max, you actually get a lot of negative values for your minimum. Um, so that's not good, right? That doesn't usually doesn't make sense you might not even have any negative values in your system. Um, and it just gives you a, 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 a wrong minimum, essentially. So uh, this is something we're looking at a bit more in order to fix. Right now, we do suggest that you calculate those minimum and maximum values outside of DHIS2, whether it's using kind of some tools that we've developed or some other statistical methods 
um, that are available. Un unfortunately, right now, that's something we need to improve upon a bit. But if you use that automated feature to calculate uh, the minimum and maximum inside DHIS2, one, as Naeem pointed out, there's not a ton of flexibility. Um, and two, often the, the minimum especially is wrong. Um, so it doesn't help you much um, because it's not giving you the right value. Okay, let's see here. Oof, almost time to let you guys go. Okay. Okay, maybe you'll just try to get cover a couple things, maybe to help answer some of the kind of outstanding questions. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here, so I'm not going to get through it all. Um, but uh, maybe your question won't be answered. Um, uh, but you can come see me, and then I can try to help you explain um, where we've made the switch and what that switch entails. Okay. Um, another uh, type of feature that I'm going to discuss are for consistency of related data are scatter plots. Now these were available or are available, I should say, uh, within the WHO data quality tool. This is looking at, uh, so we don't have the consistency over time for scatter plots yet. We are working on that, but we do have consistency of related data. And the, the nice thing about it is it's much more flexible, much more sensitive, and uses an array of different methods uh, that you can define for the statistical relationship between the two variables, rather than sticking to one, which is kind of like a guesstimate, I think, in the WHO tool. 33%, 55%, I mean, it's no real basis um, in statistics. It's just you guessing what the what the difference should be, okay? Um, so uh, here, I'll just uh, quickly go over here. Okay, this is a scatter plot in DHIS2. Um, for anyone who's kind of worked with the WHO data quality tool before, you might be familiar um, with this type of scatter plot. Uh, this is looking at consistency of two related data items. Okay, in this case, I have ANC1 on my y axis, ANC4 on my x axis. Okay, and what I'm looking for is an expected relationship between these two variables. That doesn't mean they'll be equal, right? Typically, they're not. Okay, but I want some kind, kind of consistency between the difference in these items that fall within a relationship that I define, okay? Um, so, um, so let me just kind of zoom in here. So all, all these red values, according to this chart, okay, are, you know, requiring some further follow-up. These lines here, these are 1% extreme values. These are our most kind of highest outliers that we should kind of prioritize for our follow-up. So this middle line here, this basically means this is the relationship between the two variables. The closer the green dots are to the middle line, the closer they are to our expected relationship. Any red dot that's outside of those lines is basically saying that it falls outside of our expected relationship. Now, the further it falls away from these outside lines, the more likely that relationship is not correct, okay? And in this case, if I scroll over the line, we're using something called a modified Z-score. Now, I know everyone might not be familiar with that term, okay? But the, the, the way it was done before in scatter plots was just through a percentage, okay? Um, but now, um, here, I can select a number of different methods, and these are much more based in, in sound statistical methods. So you might be familiar with some of them, right? Interquartile range, Z-score, modified Z-score, okay? Rather than just defining a percentage for the difference, okay? And then we can define what that threshold should be. Okay, and the higher the, the threshold, the, the more sensitive the model is to finding outliers. Um, when I say sensitive, basically uh, you can either say, let me find a lot of outliers, let me find a small amount of outliers. Um, if I say more sensitive, it'll find more outliers, generally speaking, okay? Because we increase, or, or sorry, decrease the acceptable um, difference between the, the variables in our relationships, okay? So um, let me just zoom out here, okay? So here it was, this is what it looks like on, on three. Just to give you an example, you can see these uh, these lines where they lie, okay? And then I can just switch it to five. Okay, so the lines kind of expand a little bit, right? This might help us investigate our relationships further. So I'll just change it back though. Okay, so let, let's just kind of explain this a little bit more. And what I'm gonna do, so the nice thing about this is it's quite an interactive chart where you can do um, lots of interesting things. If I can get... Okay, so what I've done is zoomed in on a particular area within the chart, because in particular, I want to investigate these, these items that are kind of really far off. So if I look at one of these, 
So here we're in examining the consistency of two related variables in this particular facility for this particular period. ANC1 was 391, ANC4 was 9. Okay. Now, what we've said is if these vary by at least a Z score of three, a modified Z score of three, the relationship, the difference between these two, identify them as outliers. Now, this one is an extreme one. So it's probably like, I don't know, it's at least above five. It's probably more closer to 10 or 20 or something. Um, so that's why it's been identified as a dot. And what we would want to do now, we don't know which side of the relationship is off necessarily, because it could be ANC1, it could be ANC4. Now, more likely, what we can check is some of these other historical values, right? So if we examine many of the historical values, ANC4 is nine in that example. So probably ANC4 is okay, but ANC1 is like, what was it? 300, 200? Yeah, 391. So probably there's something with, wrong with ANC1, okay? In this particular example. So we'd wanna follow up on that value and then determine, is this within our expected kind of limits relationship? And this is kind of harder to spot, right? It doesn't look like such an extreme value necessarily. But if we compare it to historical data or compare it to data that it relates to that variable, uh, we might find out that some type of error has been made either in our reporting or our data entry. Maybe this should only be 39, for example, or maybe it should be nine or something and just too many characters were entered. Um, and that can happen sometimes. All right. I'll reset the Zoom. Okay. So this is a chart type inside of DHIS2 called scatter. Okay. And then to modify all the outlier options, I apologize, I'm going very quickly, quickly I know. Um, we do have all this documented though, okay? Then you go to options, outliers, and then you have uh, all the different options to perform your outlier analysis um, for these two related variables, okay? Okay. Uh -huh. Um, another one is dropout rates. I mentioned those previously. It's very common for immunization, but of course can be used um, for other other use cases as well. Um, I'll just use the dashboard to examine this one. Output rates are kind of fine here, but oops. Okay. Um, you can see the screenshot here, though. So, for those of you kind of familiar with this measure, this was also something that you could do previously in the tool to analyze consistency of related variables. Um, this is a very common measure for immunization, but can be used for other functions as well. Um, ANC uh, one to four dropout rate, for example, any service. <laughs> Apologies. Any service where there's follow-up follow values. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and uh, we have some resources and links um, for this as well. Okay, so for all these sections, um, I've tried to put in links um, for more details on how to configure them, how they're utilized, explanations of them. Okay, I don't have a lot of time and I have way more left. Okay, so I'm not going to get through all this by any means. Okay, I'll show one more feature and then I'll kind of see where you guys are at and let you guys go for the for the evening. Okay, so another feature um, that we saw in the tool previously for consistency was year over year charts. These were very kind of basic and easy to interpret. You know, if I have a look at this chart, I can kind of, you know, without any real training, I can see what the obvious outliers are, right? And that's the kind of advantage of some of these tools. Not all of them have to be as advanced as I was describing previously. Some of them can just kind of identify immediate data quality issues and can be easy. For example, you could have someone maybe at a district level or a provincial level and, you know, providing training to them on how to interpret this, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory. So a lot of these measures um, can be, you know, don't have to be as complex as I was describing. Those are just there to kind of supplement some of the uh, measures of data quality that we have, okay? So I'll just show you some examples of this on the dashboard. Okay. okay. 
So here's an example of one of these uh, year over year charts. And we saw this uh, previously in the WHO data quality tool as well. Um, you can see there are some values basically that don't seem to align when compared to previous years. So how these charts work, one year is one line of data, okay? Um, and we can see here it's showing January to December. I can just hover over one line to show you. So these are the values. If I just maybe get rid of some of these. Okay. So one line is one year of data. We can see here January 2023 till December 2023 for that same variable. And then I've just overlaid a number of other years data. So I have 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, okay? And what we're looking for is extreme variations in the pattern from year to year or month to month, okay? So for this particular month in March, I have five years of data to compare to, right? And generally speaking, maybe we see an increase in services because your population is increasing, but we wouldn't see like a massive spike all of a sudden, right? Like an increase in this case, if we saw a value of 30,000 or something, that would be too high, right? So then we want to investigate what the source of that problem is. Uh, and maybe we do a more detailed outlier analysis in order to identify the specific facility or facilities where this is coming from in order to fix those values. We can see this in this example here, okay? Where we have all these lines kind of closely bundled together for ANC1. And then for December, 2022, we have this huge spike in the data um, that is much higher than the other values. Doesn't mean it's incorrect necessarily, but it warrants investigation, right? And typically a person could log in on a month to month basis, have a look at these charts. And you know, if something looked incorrect, they would at least be able to flag it for possible follow-up. Um, so you could investigate the issue further, all right? Okay, outliers, there's a lot of stuff on outliers, so. Uh... Okay, let's try to finish by 4.45. Okay, so outliers was also another feature that was quite heavily supported within the WHO data quality app. But now we have actually more granularity on displaying outliers and utilizing outliers for a number of calculations. And what we're looking at is outliers over time. Um, so once again, we kind of stick to defining these for the core variables. Um, within DHIS2 because the configuration is heavy. Um, but then once again, if you select your core data quality variables to use within your framework, you'd want to configure these types of outlier analyses for those specific variables, okay? Uh, we heavily rely on the use of, of this concept called predictors um, uh, to, to define these and set them up, okay? Uh, so <laughs> this is kind of the long-winded way of, of describing how these are um, configured. I'm not going to touch into that because that's a that's a whole uh, longer session, um, but just to give you some idea, okay? So we have various predictors and data elements that are used. Eventually, we get down here, which are values that are outliers, okay? And then we get data, uh, the data values excluding outliers. So if we remove the outliers from our totals, what would our new value be, okay? So let me just show some examples of this. Okay, wait, let's go through an example first, okay? Just so you can get a grip on what I'm describing, all right? So let's have a look at ANC1 here. And the middle column is what's been reported for ANC1 over a 12 month period. The total for that is 6,415. An outlier has been identified in this orange color, okay? Uh, then we have some other columns, ANC1 excluding outliers on the left-hand, well, when you're looking at it, I guess, it's the left-hand side, okay? And ANC1 outliers, which is on the right-hand side, okay? So what we're able to do is get a summary and all these values that you see here, we, we, we get them in the system, okay? So you're able to create a summary of all these different values for some more detailed analysis on outliers. And you're able to also exclude these values. And I'll kind of discuss the implications of this in a moment. And then we'll maybe end, okay? So the first thing we kind of do to make sure we can calculate all this is calculate our threshold, our statistical threshold, okay? So we take all the values we have in that column. Um, we then get um, the mean plus three standard deviations. So the mean is another word for average, okay? So we take 6,415, divide it by 12, and then we add the mean plus three, CV8, three standard deviations to that total. That gives us our statistical threshold, okay? So we don't want the overall value, 6,415, or any other, or sorry, any single value within the month. 
to be over that value. Now that value is also throwing off our mean quite a bit, our average, right? It's increasing our value uh, a lot, but let's just try to stick to one thing at a time. Okay, so then we get a count of the outliers and in DHIS2, we can define that. So we can say how many of the values that are reported in the last 12 months for this specific variable are an outlier, okay? And in this case, it returns a value of one because that large value of 4,243 is an outlier, okay? And that would be saved in DHIS2. You could display it on a dashboard. You could display it in a pivot table, on a chart, whatever, okay? And you could display it per org unit that you define this for, okay? So if you maybe are working in a district and they have 10 facilities, you could show for those 10 facilities how many outliers have been identified, okay? And then you say, well, how many were uh, not outliers, okay? Um, for this particular, well, that should be 11, okay? Sorry. Um, So on the way to this 10, there's only 11 values. <laughs> Brain is getting fried here. Okay, so then there's uh, there's 11 total values. So 10 of them are not outliers. So you get a count of those as well, okay? This one, okay, this one here. So this one might be a little tricky, okay? But it's this column, okay? When you're facing, once again, leftmost column, ANC1 excluding outliers. What this is doing is removing the outlier from the total and giving you a new total, okay? Without the outlier affecting your overall data value, okay? So the ANC1 value excluding your outliers is 2,172 because it does not include this value of 4,243 in the overall total. And then we have the actual outlier value, which is this value here, okay? We can then get, um, oops, a percentage representation of this, okay? And a percentage representation of how many values are outliers, okay? So there's a lot of uh, stuff that can be done. There's a whole lot of guidance on this um, information, but what I'll do, okay? So let's just kind of, you can see the, just to kind of quickly see the implications of this. What I'm looking at here, I have a bar chart or a column chart, okay? The green bar is the data, uh, ANC1 value excluding the outlier. The blue bar is the value including the outlier, okay? And for most of them, they're, they're not that different, right? There's a difference of 100, 200, 300, okay? As a national total, not so bad, okay? But we do see this obvious one here, right? The green bar is the value excluding the outlier. It's just 29,000. If I include the outliers for that particular month in December, it's 45,000, 15,000 higher, okay? So this is kind of the implication of including those outliers within your totals, right? In some cases, if they're really statistically incorrect or just impossible, then they should not be included when you're making reports. This will also affect your national total, for example. If I were to make any type of estimate on ANC1 coverage for December, it would be wrong if I included those outliers, right? It would probably be over 100% in this scenario. So that doesn't make any sense either. So that's why we try to exclude those outliers for analysis, or at least identify what those outliers are so we can identify some follow-up action that we can perform in order to mitigate the effect those have on our overall national totals, okay? Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I've given you a lot of information, I apologize. There's still a lot more that we include, okay? So we have various methods for outlier analysis, there's resources for all this stuff. We have validation rules and notifications, okay, which we can also include our outliers in the validation rules. We can also perform external consistency analysis using these validation rules. I didn't have an opportunity to discuss that, but if you bring in data, you can you can do that external consistency analysis as well. Uh, we have uh, various notifications that you can be sent um, to an email, okay? Um, and then we have a number of... Uh, uh, considerations for um, implementation, okay? It's not just features. So I have a lot of guidance that we've recently written, okay? We have SOPs, we have the full toolkit, we have checklists, we have other types of configuration that support the use um, of these features, okay? And I put all that in the Google Drive. So for example, oops, okay? We have a SOP template for data quality that discusses kind of general roles, responsibilities, what the different levels of the health information system should be responsible for and what they should do and what they should perform, 
This will load. Okay. If you're considering revising your data quality procedures, we also have checklists basically of the different tasks you should consider if you're looking to implement new data quality procedures or strengthen your data quality configuration within DHIS2. So we have kind of uh, both various kind of preparatory tasks in terms of kind of reviewing things and getting things set up, kind of what we kind of expect would be minimally configured. Um, the different type of outputs and reports. The data quality tool, WHO data quality tool is still in there because there is a report um, and there's all kinds of visualizations. There's the dashboards, um, links to this. And then we have all the implementation um, side of things as well. Within that SOP and within the Google Drive. Okay. There's also a checklist for observing behavior at lower levels of the health system. Okay, to ensure that all the various procedures that you've implemented are being reviewed on a routine basis. Okay, so this is kind of to accompany training and, and your standard operating procedures to make sure that behaviors are changing over time. Okay, um, with the various checks that we've described and basically saying if people are performing them on a routine basis, yes or no, this would be typically filled in by, by the supervising person um, within that facility or district or whichever level um, you happen to be working with. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. I apologize. There's just too much for me to get through. Um, but uh, okay, so it's 445. I know you have your social event at 530. So you can meet at the lobby at 530. If you have any questions, I'm happy to stay back and answer any questions. Um, and if there's any more kind of questions about this during the week, please have a look at the remainder of